Hi, I'm Gail Jarvik, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the 2018 recipient of the Advocacy Award, my colleague, Dr. Mary Claire King. Dr. King is the American Cancer Society Professor of Medicine and Genome Sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle. This award honors individuals or groups who have exhibited excellence and achievement in the applications of human genetics for the common good. Dr. King is well known for her foundational discoveries in breast cancer genetics and her ongoing investigations in many fields, but particularly cancer genetics, schizophrenia, and hearing loss. When she first proposed a Mendelian form of breast ovarian cancer, the idea was not universally accepted. However, her 1990 science paper removed most doubt when she provided linkage with a LOD score of 5.98 to chromosome 17Q21. And since I'm wearing chromosome 17, I think it's about here. Since then, her lab has identified more than 50 genes responsible for a wide range of conditions. However, that's not why we're here today. We are here to honor her long history of adapting genetic technologies to advocate globally for justice and respect for all persons. These are lesser told stories of her career. Our first story begins with the Argentinian military dictatorship of 1976 to 83, when executions of students and intellectuals and others took the life of over 30,000 disappeared. The grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo in 1983 hoped to use science to find their grandchildren who had been kidnapped as infants when their parents were taken and murdered. They found Dr. King. The technologies of the day were not up to the task, so she invented new technologies based on mitochondrial DNA sequencing that are the cornerstone of forensic DNA work even today. Over the past 35 years, her lab has helped reunite 130 families, and they have also helped Argentinian geneticists become autonomous in continuing this work themselves. The story continues to evolve. In 1990, she joined the United Nations Task Force anthropology team, which is using her mitochondrial DNA methods to identify the remains of victims of extrajudicial executions, as well as soldiers long missing from wars in the Pacific and in Europe. Another story of engagement comes from the Middle East. For the past 20 years, she has worked with Israeli and Palestinian colleagues to establish and obtain international funding for rigorous projects that discover the basis of inherited predisposition to cancer and other congenital disorders of that region. She has helped to develop local expertise to allow them autonomy and sustain success for laboratories on the West Bank. Her global, con her global engagement continues. We are honored that Dr. King has been a longtime member of our society and our president in 2012. Join me in recognizing Dr. King's tireless, de tireless dedication to using her science to help others and to advocate for persons and families by presenting her with the ASHG Advocacy Award. Well done, Dr. King. Thanks so much, Gail. So the last time that I had the privilege of speaking to the entire membership of ASHG was in 2012. We were in San Francisco, and as you'll recall, as I was speaking, because of the difference in time zones, polling places were closing across the country during the talk. It was early on in the days of, of um, Twitter, but many people were tweeting, and they were tweeting to each other, and people in the front row were signaling what the story was about the re-election of President Obama. And it was so delightful by the end of my talk to realize that it was, it was going to happen. We had that year really, I think, a sense of unlimited possibility, both in ourselves and in our country. I said in my talk then that I wanted to advocate for evidence and for common sense. Science still conveys this sense of unlimited possibilities, but our world is much starker. So what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is, is present three thoughts for advocacy for us today in our stark world. These will be in three little categories. One, advocacy as human geneticists. Second, advocacy for human geneticists. 
and third, advocacy as citizens. So, advocacy as human geneticists. <laughs> By this I mean confronting distortions of our field, lies about our field, um, misuse of our field for evil ends. Obviously this isn't new, it's as old as our field. We heard earlier from David Nelson um, about Dr. Morgan and his efforts to do exactly what I'm talking about today. For the most recent manifestation of this problem, I'd recommend uh, Amy Harmon's excellent article in the New York Times. Her, her, her surname is spelled H-A-R-M-O-N if, if you want to Google her while I'm talking. Uh, the article appeared a few days ago and it delineates in, in detail the misuse of genetic analysis, both ancestry testing and some other concepts that I'll get to in just a moment, by white supremacists. Don't miss, if you check this article, don't miss the video of um, racist bozos chugging milk, saying that only those with lactose tolerance are allowed into America. Don't miss Ms. Harmon's comment about the Maasai. How are we to address distortions like this? Well, in the context of the Harmon piece are some excellent com comments from John Novembre and subsequent, immediately subsequent to the piece, we have an excellent article, short article, by our ASHG board that addresses the same themes independently. However, I gotta say, sorry David Nelson, I think the best comment is from Stephen Colbert, which I also recommend that you, that you Google. You, any combination of Stephen Colbert, um, genetics, genomics, white supremacists will pull this up. A couple of days ago, Stephen Colbert had a piece on Supreme Genetics, which is the latest competitor to Ancestry.com and 23andMe, and which will tell you that you are of the supreme race regardless of who you are. You need not even send your DNA. So I think we can contribute also in our more humble ways. We cannot be Stephen, but we can, we can give it a try. And I, wanted, I want to try out on you some thinking that I've just undertaken in the last 24 hours about one of these areas. One area of fodder for the white supremacists in the current, um, in, in the current uh, genomic space is the misuse of polygenic risk scores. In particular, polygenic risk scores for social traits, for example, for educational attainment, for which, of course, polygenic risk scores have been calculated. Um, we, in polygenic risk scores, we encounter a metric that has some properties that are now emerging in a fairly consistent way. First, that significant polygenic risk scores can be identified for many phenotypes in the case control context. Second, that the polygenic risk scores don't translate across continental population groups. And third, that the polygenic risk scores are not meaningful within families. So what kind of a metric has these features? My hypothesis is that a metric that has these features is not measuring causal genetic traits or genetic causes, but is measuring genetic correlates. For example, if we were to work with the European continental population, we would have a highly significant polygenic risk score for the capacity to speak Gaelic. Not because that capacity is genetic, sorry about this, Tom Walsh, but because speaking Gaelic is, is, a, is a social trait, a historic trait that is highly correlated with genotype, we would have the same experience were we to develop a polygenic risk score among South Asians for speaking Thai and so on. It wouldn't work if we develop, tried to develop a polygenic risk score for speaking English because for historical reasons, English has spread across many population groups so the correlation has broken down. The same logic applies, I think, if we think about non-genetic, that is environmental or behavioral or exposure or lifestyle, risk factors for common traits. So to take the example of cardiovascular disease, there are significant polygenic risk scores for cardiovascular disease in the case control context. I speculate that these polygenic risk scores are correlated less with the biological underpinnings of cardiovascular disease than they are identifiers, subtle but very accurate identifiers, of social class, which are in turn correlated with diet, propensity to decide to smoke, sedentary lifestyle, and obesity, 
Without question from the epidemiologic literature, those factors are social class related. Also without question in this country, social class has genetic correlates, even within race. The same is true for breast cancer and uh, risk factors for breast cancer that are non-genetic. For example, when a girl begins to menstruate, when she has her first pregnancy, both of which are driven by non-genetic factors, diet in the first case and education in the second. So I think what we're, what we're measuring with polygenic risk scores is indeed something real. It's a very subtle way of detecting differences within populations that are based on social class and are in turn correlated with risk factors for important traits. So I'm still working on this. Stay tuned. I'm going to try to put together a commentary on this in the next few months. The other part of our advocacy as human geneticists is, I think, also a constant. And that is that it's our responsibility to tell our fellow citizens about the value of our work. Human genetics is the soul of precision medicine. It's so much the soul of precision medicine that medical genetics is now so integrated into so many other fields that many people from many different areas of, of medicine think of themselves as geneticists as well as cardiologists, oncologists, or whatever. We as, as geneticists can, I think, point out to skeptics at any point in the political spectrum the value of our work for example, how treatments for certain forms of cancer are now dependent on genotype, both of the patient and of the tumor, PARP inhibitors in my field. We can also point out the enormous value of pregestational diagnosis and how it is being integrated in real time in many parts of the world with genetic diagnosis of congenital abnormalities. These are real, these are positive, and and we, we need to get the word out about them. And there's lots of ways to do this. I mean, one can do this in local papers, one can do this with local interviews on television, one can, just, one can do this with undergraduates, one can do this in tutoring high school children, one can just keep it, keep it up. As our previous speaker said, just keep going. Second point, advocacy for human genesis. This is not new either. When I was at the beginning of my career, there was a AAAS committee on uh, what was it called? I think it was called Human Rights, for, Human Rights and Scientific, Scientific Freedom and Responsibility. Human Rights, Scientific Freedom and Responsibility. And the goal was to help uh, scientists who were stuck behind the Iron Curtain or as, as history evolved in various other um, totalitarian regimes to help them get out. And, and it did an enormous amount of good and, and partnered with Amnesty International to write on behalf of, of many imprisoned scientists. And I, and I commend to you that same activity now. The need for it hasn't gone away at all. But I'd like to mention one thing in particular that I think is important for us to do, and that is to help our colleagues who now, in America, are confronting immigration issues that they had no idea would be as, as stark as they are when they first came to this country. We are, none of us probably in this room, certainly not I, are expert in this area. We can't help them with substantive advice. But what we can do, we can do two things. We can work with our networks to find them good legal representation. I mean, if you are a new person in a strange land, in a strange city, it's not likely you're going to know who the best immigration lawyers are. I don't know either, but I can certainly find out because I have friends who have friends who will know. So network on behalf of your friends from elsewhere who are confronting immigration issues. And second, we can offer moral support just to go out of our way to say we are so glad you are here. If there's anything I can do just to help while you're going through this rough time. We're here for you, we care about you, we want this to work out for you. Call on me for help in ways that I can help. And finally, advocacy as citizens. The country votes in three weeks. Virtually all of us are either in or more frequently near a district that is critical in the next election. It may not seem that way because we all seem to live in such homogeneous academic environments, but this, as you of course know, is a very patchy country. There is a district just up the way here in Southern California that is right on the edge. Could go either way. There is a district in Houston where we will meet next year right on the edge, could go either way. There's a district just across Lake Washington from my lab, same thing, could go either way. Given the, the polarization of the country, everything depends on who votes. 
So we need to be involved in helping to get out the vote in a very active way. How can we do that? How can we learn enough to know what to do? There's a website. It's called Vote Save America, and it is a spin-off of a truly fine website that probably most of you knew about before I did called Pod Save America, P-O-D, Save America. In Vote Save America, one will find information, one will find actions that one can take that are targeted, that are local, that are feasible. Check it out and tell your, tell your students about it. A lot can be done in three weeks and everything depends on who votes. So above all, don't despair, but act. We are many, we are strong. Love the work that you do, both in the lab and outside of it, and take care of each other. Thanks.